Okay, I guess we'll get started. Hello and welcome to all of you who have joined us for this online media briefing. I'm Olivia from the Australian Science Media Centre. While food delivery services have been getting a good workout over the past year, space nerds around the world have eagerly awaited a different kind of package. Hayabusa 2 is set for another milestone in its six-year, 5.2 billion kilometre journey this week, with its sample return capsule from the asteroid Ryugyu uh, landing right here in the Aussie desert. The Japanese explorer is carrying the first ever subsurface, subsurface mind you, uh, asteroid samples, one of the only uh, of a few, well, sorry, one of only a few extraterrestrial samples to have ever been brought to Earth. I note that today's briefing is an immediate release, meaning it is not under embargo. Joining us today are four speakers. The first is the Deputy Head of the Australian Space Agency, Anthony Murphy. Next, we will hear from Professor Masaki Fujimoto, the Deputy Director General of the Department of Solar System Sciences at ISAS and JAXA. Then we will hear from Andrew Seedhouse. He's the Chief of Intelligence, Surveillance and Space Division at DST. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Ed Cruzens. He's the CSIRO Director of NASA Operations and the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. There will be an opportunity to ask questions of any of the speakers today at the end of the presentation. You can pop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Don't forget to include your affiliation with each question. What I mean by that is uh, please include your name and what outlet you're from so that we can associate the questions with that. So please also be sure to use the Q&A box and not the similar looking chat box. So we'll begin now with Anthony Murphy, handing over to you, Anthony. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Anthony Murphitt. I'm the Deputy Head of the Australian Space Agency. And firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet. I'm meeting with the land of the Nullarbor people, but I'd also like to pay my respect to both the Nullarbor people, their elders past, present and emerging, but all the uh, Indigenous Australians and the lands on which we meet across this nation uh, today. Um, it really is fantastic to be here alongside Professor Masakai Futamuru from JAXA, Dr. Ed uh, Cruzen from CS and Seedhouse from DSTG, where we'll talk to you about our organisations and our role in supporting JAXA's extremely exciting Higher Booster 2 mission. And I must say, it is a real privilege and honour for Australia to be part of this journey and what is a signature piece. And I think we're all going to be looking forward to hearing from Masako San on what has been such an instrumental and inspiring uh, mission, particularly as we look at the challenges the world has faced through the pandemic uh, in 2020. One of my hopes is missions such as this with Hayabusa 2 ends the year with an inspirational piece as people do grapple with those challenges associated with COVID-19. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the role of the Australian Space Agency in supporting JAXA in its mission. And I'll also touch a little bit about the, the strong relationship that Australia and Japan have both in a science and in a space context. Firstly, and we'll go to the next slide, I'll just start with the purpose of the Australian Space Agency. We've got a very clear purpose to grow and transform a globally respected space industry that lifts the broader economy, inspires and improves the lives of all Australians. But importantly with today, it's underpinned by strong national and international engagement. And if I look at the JAXA mission, when we're working with Hayabusa 2, nothing has been clearer as we've supported JAXA, both working across the nation to support this mission, but a close engagement with JAXA, as well as with NASA to support Hayabusa 2. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So turning to JAXA and the Australian Space Agency, it, the Hayabusa 2 mission is happening at such an instrumental time in uh, the history of collaboration between our two nations as it relates to both science and space. Firstly, 2020 marks the 40 year of treaty between our two countries, of which the partnership with JAXA is an important part. 
The treaty has fostered collaboration between our two countries by linking researchers and institutions together to exploit joint opportunities uh, between our nations, underpinned by very strong science, technology and innovation. And turning to space, uh, this year we've uh, signed a memorandum of cooperation in July 2020 uh, with JAXA and the Australian Space Agency. And this draws on with the Australian Space Agency's Australian government's civil space strategy, where it indicated that JAXA and Japan is an instrumental partner as as Australia looks to grow and transform our globally respected space industry, create those 20,000 jobs and triple the size of the economy. And a really important part of this is to build a strong base and relationship. The memorandum of cooperation we've signed this year sets that uh, sets the starting blocks, but we're building on 20 years of engagement in space and building on the first Hayabusa mission in 2010. So we have a strong history and with the landing of Hayabusa 2 uh, this weekend, again, sets a strong scene for very strong collaboration between our nations going forward. And just some of the other exciting activities that we're working on includes a Kibo ABC mission where there are wattle seeds from Australia now going to the ISS. And that has been such an exciting project because that project was a way we were able to engage with Australian kids and they can compare what happens with wattle seeds on Earth and in space and undertake some of that scientific uh, rigor and investigation to work out the, the great things that can happen in space. And we're very, very grateful to, uh, to be able to work with Japan who offered us that opportunity to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Turning to Hayabusa 2, as I outlined at the start, Australia is very uh, humbled and privileged to be part of what is going to be such an instrumental and important mission. I know uh, Masakai san will talk through this, but returning the first subsurface uh, sample from an asteroid is truly remarkable. And the fact that Australia can be part of this journey comes back to proving again that Australia can be a trusted partner in space. We were trusted when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. We've been trusted for 60 plus years with space communications, as Ed will talk about very, very soon. And again, in an instrumental mission such as Hayabusa 2, Australia is there with an international partner to really uh, uh, support the success of this mission. And the two roles that we play, we've had two important parts. The first part has been, we've been responsible for the regulatory of the mission and secondly supporting coordination across government particularly in light of the pandemic uh, circumstances in which we're operating to ensure we can make and have the conditions required for this mission to be a success next slide please so very briefly on our regulatory role there are two key things that we uh, undertook uh, our minister minister karen andrews uh, approved the authorization of return of an overseas launch space object under the Space Activities uh, Act 1998. And this uh, provide the, uh, the, the agreement for Hayabusa 2 to return into Australia. And the second part that we played was to approve the re-entry maneuver um, around TCM3, which I know Masakai San will talk about shortly, that puts it on trajectory for Hayabusa 2 to return into Australia. Uh, next slide, please. The other big role that this agency has played is our coordination role. When I think back to our purpose, which is to grow our globally respected space industry, an important part of that has been to have a front door where international agencies can come and talk to Australia about space. And with the establishment of the Australian Space Agency in July 2018, JAXA was able to reach out and we've been working with them to coordinate the vast array of activities that need to happen to uh, for Hayabusa 2 to return. Of course, working closely with uh, CSIRO, um, which Ed will talk about shortly, and of course, DSTG, because the activity is happening in the Woomera Protected Area. But there are a range of other areas that we have had to work across, including home affairs, uh, et cetera, to ensure that we can support the success of this activity. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to close with a hand over to um, many of the other speakers we're here today, but I just how exciting this mission is. 
I've spoken about the challenges that the world has faced with COVID-19 this year and many are still grappling with around the world. I truly hope that the return of Hayabusa 2 really gives a sense of inspiration and hope to not only Australia but to the world and what can be achieved in space and give that glimmer of inspiration as we face some of these really hard challenges with, pan with the pandemic. And if the exciting thing about space, it does inspire and I really hope that um, the world um, draws what is going to be such an exciting mission. And finally, Australia is very humbled uh, to be involved. This sets a very strong base for us to work closely with JAXA going forward and a vast array of uh, missions. Uh, we're wishing uh, JAXA all the success and we're very happy to be on that journey with them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. And now moving on to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Masaki Fujimoto. Handing over to you, Michael. All right, thank you. So I'd like to uh, describe what our mission, have as a tool is like. It's a sample of a mission, and its target is a um, primordial asteroid, Ryugu. So if you go to the second, second next slide. So we did um, touch down. It's a sample of mission, which means that we have to get the sample from the surface of the asteroid, which we did by uh, making a touch and go sampling. Like, like shown in this image. And if you go to the next slide, we did it twice. Um, when we got to the uh, target asteroid Ryugu, we were so shocked to see the rough surface everywhere. So it was really tough to find any landing spot at all, but we dared to do the touchdown twice. And the second touchdown, the reason we dared to do the second touchdown is that we made a super successful impact experiment which managed to excavate subsurface material onto the surface from where we can get the sample. So we moved on to do the second touchdown so that we get the subsurface sample. And then the next slide shows that we are already on a track back to Earth. It's not only we're going back to, we're returning to Earth, we are returning to, uh, we are, we are heading towards Umera. Uh, there was a um, trajectory correction maneuver, TCM three and four. TCM three, uh, made uh, have uh, two spacecraft to head towards Umera and TCM4, which was just performed yesterday, is now um, precisely um, maneuvering it towards the center of the landing ellipse we have set up um, in, in planning. Then the next slide shows that we are coming back to Umera because uh, we've done this 10 years ago with Hayabusa 1. And then uh, we find it very nice to be back here. So that's why I'm here again. I, I'm actually, I'm in Umer now today. So the next slide will uh, show what, why we care about sample return so much. Hayabusa is a sample return mission from a primordial asteroid. And the reason we care about primordial asteroid is that it's uh, linked to the process that made our planet habitable. Earth was born inside the snow line close to the sun, so it was born dry. Original Earth didn't have water at all. So somebody from outside the snow line has to bring water to our planet to make our planet habitable. And we think that it's, uh, it's a small body like Ryugu, primordial asteroid, that were born outside the snow line, but somehow uh, came into the inner part of the solar system and, and hit the Earth. And by that process, Earth became habitable. Somebody like Ryugu brought water to Earth, and that's why we are here. So I think it's a fundamental question we are, we are, we are going after. And uh, that's, I think that's why we, we need somebody, something like dedicated effort of sample return mission to solve the question. The next slide shows what we, we, what's going to happen soon in Umara. So on December 5th, Capsule, a sample return capsule will be released from the spacecraft and it will head towards Umera. Then the next slide shows what's going to happen on the day, on the next day. So around 4 a.m. in the morning of 6th of December, there will be a fireball running across the sky above Cuba Petty, uh, 400 kilometers north of Umera. And that's going to be a spectacular view. So if you, are, if you happen to live close to it, you better, you better we better wake up early and watch the sky. And then this fireball um, is, is brightest when the capsule is around uh, 40, 50 kilometers altitude. 
but as it descends down to 10 kilometer altitude, a parachute will be deployed and the beacon signal starts beeping. And we will track this beacon signal, triangulate the beacon signal to reconstruct the trajectory of the capsule. Then we get the good, um, good guess of where the landing spot of the capsule will be. And then, next slide shows that, we will fly a team to that landing spot to recover the capsule itself. So that's this, this exciting operation that's going to happen in the next weekend. And this is really like the grand finale of our 10-year uh, effort, if you include the development time, a six-year cruise of the spacecraft itself. Then the next slide. You might be wondering, why does it, did it have to be Umera? Well, we, this is like second time. We've been here 10 years ago already. Um, but for this kind of big operation, safe landing of the sample return capsule, you need a big open flat area under control of somebody we, we know. And Umera fits. We were satisfied that condition. And especially for this Hyabusa 2, um, sample, 2 operation, it's a sample back from Ryugu. And the, the plant science requires that you have to quickly store the sample in the in a curation facility. Otherwise, uh, the, the value of the sample may be degraded. So it has to be the big open flat area has to be in a place that's accessible and Umera satisfied that condition. And of course, of course, for smooth operation, um, you have to have the, you have to work with the local people, and you have to have nice people working together with, with us, nice people who share the same value, with, uh, with us, and again, Umera satisfy that condition. So all in all, it had to it just has to be in Umera our oper our capsule re recovery operation to be. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Masaki. Our third speaker is Andrew Seedhouse. Handing over to you, Andrew. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, hello, it's Andrew. I'm from uh, Defence Science and Technology Group, which is the S&T arm of, of Defence. Uh, I'd first like to uh, thank Anthony for acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the lands. Uh, just pleased to add that as I'm here speaking from South Australia and the part of South Australia I'm in, uh, it's this the, the land of the Ghana people, so I send my respects to them and their elders. Uh, I think what I'm just going to do here is give a bit of context as to uh, defence and especially DSTG's role uh, within this mission. And uh, I think just to point out that we're not just nice people, we can do other things as well. So th thanks for that com comment. Next slide, please. So the, the real context for us in, in defence is the fact that because we now have a number of new strategies out there, that especially the force structure plan, which was uh, published recently, it shows a, a re incentivization of engaging in space for defense. And these three topics on here space control, services, and geospatial information are the three areas of capability that defense is looking to acquire and have more capability in the future. And what I'd like to do is just focus there a little bit on the space control program, which is, has space domain awareness in it, which is all about learning about uh, how satellites and bodies are moving in space. Uh, and being able to operate in space and learning how to be a good partner and working in space so we don't cause hazards or any damage while we're up in space. And <clears throat> really working on this program is, is part of that journey. Uh, for example, uh, up in Rumour at the moment as we speak, uh, we have staff from DSTG who are working on a program called Space Fest, which is looking at the tracking of multiple objects in space. So we have a situation awareness capability. And as we move towards the weekend, as we come to the re-entry phase of this, then we'll be also uh, looking at JAXA, looking at uh, predicted uh, trajectories, and also uh, being able to try and predict and measure that re-entry, which we'll learn from in the process of doing that. And we share that information between the two nations as well. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> for us, in terms of developing the whole picture for space in defense, uh, it's a really good time to do this um, because A, Defence is very keen and leaning in with a big programme uh, to acquire space capability. But also we've seen the formation of a number of bodies within Australia, such as the Space Agency, but also um, the SmartSat CRC. And of course, the folks that have been in this, this game for some time, like CSIRO. And there's a big community there able to work together to build up the capability in Australia. And we're very much looking for a new approach 
Uh, well, this is one of the new things which we're reaching out to others about in terms of looking at the new technologies that are available now and in the next 10, 20 years. And of course, a key part of all that work we're doing is reaching out to our friends in other nations to help us develop things, not only uh, to learn from them on this journey, but also to, to share our load of the science and technology development and to share that as good scientists we should do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little explanation of what the S&T journey is for, for defence. Uh, I apologise for the quality of my graphics here, but uh, essentially we've got a 10-step programme. And uh, we started uh, a few years back looking at uh, CubeSat uh, capabilities. We've been building those in Australia and been launching some of those. We're now looking at cooperation in space between them. Um, the automated space domain monitoring demonstration is all part of the work which we are now doing in collaboration with others at Woomera uh, this week. And we'll be doing this uh, another Space Fest, I think, next year as well. And we're just about to start step three, which is looking at small payloads. Uh, I'm talking about small satellites in the 100 kilo class. Uh, we're looking at launching a, a radar development program for a payload on a small satellite uh, very soon, just after Christmas. And then we'll continue our journey all the way up to a full space system capability demonstration in, in, at step 10. So it's a long way to go, uh, a lot of technology pulled together and uh, we've been really helpful. Uh, this this uh, step two, uh, the work that's going on at Woomera is really a good part of that. Next step, please. Next slide, sorry. Uh, so first of all, put, uh, funny sign, uh, point out, uh, we actually are in a bit of a hurry because um, the prime minister announced that we would have a space capability, uh, sovereign capability in defense at the end of this decade. Uh, it's not quite go to the moon and back, but it still is a, a you know, significant announcement. Uh, and that means we've got a lot of capability technology to develop. <clears throat> uh, we all also have a lot of bright uh, new industries that are starting up in Australia. Um, that, uh, they're in their infancy. Uh, we need to look at ways of working together across government to, mix, to accelerate that capability such that they can have a good share of the sovereign capability building that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're in defence. We're learning a lot about how to operate. Uh, Thank you, Andrew. And our final speaker today is Ed Cruzens. Handing over to you, Ed. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. And hello, everyone. And I'd like to follow up with what Anthony said. We acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, past, present, and emerging. Um, I'm Ed Cruzens. I'm the director of the Deep Space Network here in Canberra. Uh, which is a facility managed by the CSIRO on behalf of NASA. Um, we are, of course, working in concert with uh, our sister stations and colleagues in Japan at Usuda and Uchinara. Uh, next slide, please. But the Deep Space Network itself is an extensive network uh, of three major facilities around the world, uh, of which our other stations are in Goldstein, California, and Madrid in Spain. Here we are in Canberra. Um, we track 35 missions, approximately, representing nearly 18, nearly $20 billion worth of assets in the sky. And uh, for nine hours of the day, Canberra controls the entire deep space network through remote connections. And um, we've been here 55 years, opened by Prime Minister Menzies in 1965. Um, having said that, we've had the honour to track the Hayabusa 2 mission uh, for six years now, and prior to that, the Hayabusa 1 mission as well. Uh, an exciting activity uh, for all of us. Next slide, please. So what? how do we do this? We have a number of antennas here. Uh, on the left, we have uh, Deep Space Station 43, and on the right, we have the 34 meter antennas, uh, which are Deep Space Station 34, 35, and 36. And those four antennas constitute the downlink and uplink capabilities of the Canberra Deep Space Network. 
The antenna on the left, the 70 metre dish, is the largest steerable dish in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're very proud to have that. There are only three in the world at the moment. So what are the functions of these antennas? Well, uh, we provide uh, telemetry capabilities at signals coming down from spacecraft. We help navigate as well. And we provide spacecraft commanding. And these are used to determine the health of the spacecraft, uh, to carry data from the sensors, and also determine the position in space uh, for these missions so we know precisely where they are. And uh, also to provide commands for manoeuvres, uh, which we heard recently for the TCM-3, for Hayabusa 2. Next slide, please. So Hayabusa 2, um, heading back to Australia as we speak. Next slide. So we were there at the launch uh, on December the 3rd, 2014, uh, from Tanegashima on a H2A launch vehicle. And we provided the initial contact with the spacecraft after launch vehicle separation. Uh, that's called LEOP. It's called Launch and Early Orbit Phase. And we took the first uh, primary telemetry tracking command support. Of course, we did this with a uh, concert with Usura and Uchiyanara in Japan. Um, and we stayed in close contact uh, with the JAXA science mission team uh, since. There are five phases that we've been involved in uh, with Hayabusa 2. Uh, launch, which I've just described. Uh, the cruise phase to the asteroid Raigu. Uh, the encounter and the sample collection. The return, and now the exciting part as well, the re-entry of Australian airspace. Next slide, please. So the navigation and telemetry aspects, the cruise phase, um, again, uh, providing the downlink uh, for that and uh, relaying that back to Japan uh, through the Deep Space Network and working with our sister facilities, doing the same thing from um, Madrid in Spain and also Goldstone in California. What was particularly interesting about this um, vehicle is it runs solar electric ion thrusters. So 66 kilograms of fuel can take you billions of kilometers, an extremely efficient way of maneuvering and a testament to Japanese technology. Next slide, please. So touchdown, uh, that happened on the 22nd of February, 2019. Uh, we were there to support our Japanese colleagues again with our deep space station dish 35 and to take the data that was coming back from the primary vehicle, including the two Minerva uh, canisters and the mascot canister as well. Uh, remaining in continuous contact, you can see there on the right, uh, that's one of our operators looking at the screens. Quite a complicated set of screens, but making sure that the signals are in lock and the data is coming down. And over the 55 years of our working with our Colleagues around the world, we have never dropped a major signal in a major event, and we won't do it again. I won't do it now either. Uh, next slide, please. Homeward bound. Um, so Hayabusa 2 departed asteroid Raegu on November the 2019th and commenced its return to Earth. Um, we've monitoring that all the way home. Um, the capsule release, though, will occur probably over the United States. So our sister station at Goldstone in California will probably capture that. Um, but we will can then catch it as it comes over the horizon and track the mothership as it comes to Earth proximity. Uh, but we will not track the vehicle as it comes down to Earth, but we will be tracking Hayabusa 2 as it then skips away and leaves Earth uh, to continue, continue on its uh, extended mission. Next slide, please. So after the Hayabusa 2 mothercraft releases the sample capsule, uh, it'll divert its course and travel to three other asteroids, uh, encountering them between 2026 and 2031. And one of those will be called 1998 KY26, which will be approximately 10 billion kilometres away from Earth in about 2021. Uh, and we continue to uh, support and uh, be part of this extremely exciting mission. Last slide, please. 
And might I say it's a great honour for us here and in Australia to provide those up and down links and connections to the Hayabusa mission. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Ed. And now there's an opportunity for journalists to ask questions of any of the speakers. Questions can be asked by typing your question into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. With each question, again, please include your name and what outlet you're from. And a reminder to use the Q&A box and not the similar looking chat box. For those of you who have joined us over the phone, we will give you an opportunity to ask questions when we unmute you in a few minutes time. So I'll just kick things off because I was quite interested to, to know that we've worked with, um, with uh, the Japan Space Agency before. So just want to know what, what difference does it make having an Australian Space Agency to work with now? Um, did, did you ask me? This is Masaki. Oh, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, what should I, where should I start from? Like, uh, maybe I, I can start from COVID-19. Um, we, we were preparing for the, we were preparing the recovery operation for two or three years, and then came the COVID-19. So we have to rearrange all the plan. And then, well, first of all, we have to get the special entry, entry visa to end, enter Australia, your country. And then we, then we have to talk to the, the state government of South blah blah blah. So, if if it if it were not for the support from the ASA Australian Space Agency, I don't think I'll be sitting here. So it's that that fundamental the support from the space agency. And of course, when it, I, I just been through a rehearsal this uh, yesterday. I mean, this this what is it, last night or whatever you call it. You know, until this morning. And uh, we've been working together with the local WPA people. And uh, again, without their support, I don't think we can we can make a step into the into the, the field at all. So, yeah, maybe I, I, my English wasn't correct by by describing that you guys are very nice, but uh, I think that's I, I, to me that's the honest way of, of describing our relationship. You 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 know. Support from the Australian people has been was just necessary for us, and then uh, we enjoy the the nice, nice, you know, the feeling of working together. Yeah, that's all I have to say. That's lovely. Thank you, Masagi. Um, so now I have a question from Jackson Ryan, the science editor from CNET. Uh, he said, "For Fujimoto-san, can you just talk a little?" bit about the moment of landing. What are the first things JAXA scientists do when the capsule is found? And also, how much sleep is everyone getting? Well, um, we just, I just think it's really rehearsal, so I have a fresh memory, uh, which I'm kind of losing because I'm getting sleepy, sleepy. But still, I can just describe what happened uh, last, last evening. So, you know, the operation starts around uh, 4 p.m. on 5th of December. That's when the capsule re release is uh, announced. Then we, we start to get ready. But the, the real thing happens around 4 a.m. When we, we, when, when we see the fireball. So for, you know, non-team members, fireball seems like the grand finale. Oh, the capsule has come back to Earth. But for us, it's really the the bell that's ringing and telling us this is not a drill, you know. So uh, then, you know, we get everything ready. We will have the, we try to localize the landing spot very quickly. And then we send the helicopter there. And then the scientists, sample science related scientists will be on that helicopter and get to the landing spot and pick up the capsule by themselves because they don't want, they don't, they, can, they kind of don't trust anybody else. Either. They think it's their precious thing. So they want to get there by themselves and grab the capsule. Well, they don't really grab it. They put it in the, in the protection box and bring it back to the headquarter. And in that headquarter building, there's a facility we built up, which has the name Quick Look Facility. So we will try to get the gas sample out of the sample container because 
you reduce uh, the, the, the sample container is sealed very precisely, but still there can be some leakage and you don't want to lose anything. You don't want to lose the gas sample out of the gas container. So as, as soon as the, the sample container comes to the quick look facility, we try to uh, we try to get the gas sample out of the container if there is any. And if we detect any gas at that stage, the gas is coming should be coming from the sample themselves, samples themselves. So getting a gas and proving that they are coming for their ex extraterrestrial Ryugu, that's almost the very first sign, although unofficial, but the, a good sign that we got some samples already. So in Australia, in Umera, we may be making the very first announcement that it's likely that we got the samples, but the official uh, announcement will be will happen when we bring the samples back to uh, back to Japan and when we open the container. But uh, if we get the samples, that's very promising. So in Numera, we will make that historical announcement. Thank you, Masaki. Uh, and I've got a question here from Matt Miller from Tra Track Zone. He also has a question for Professor Fukunoto. Uh, compared to the first mission, has having the space agency formed improved the ease and efficient efficiency of recovering the capsule? So of course, um, uh, just like Anthony said, well, we have, we, you know, if we had to do it alone, or if I do it all by ourselves, we need to talk to many agencies within Australia. But what we actually did is we we just talked to uh, Australian Space Agency. Actually, there was one one nice uh, lady working for uh, you know who partnered with us, and we we kept on emailing her. You know, can you can you help us doing this? Can you help us doing this? So it, it it's really literally a single a single point of contact, and that was really really smooth. That really made our business very easy, and I really I really wanna. Uh, express my uh, appreciation for the, all the support I've been getting from the Australian people. Thank you for that. And I have a question here from Stuart Late from the Brisbane Times. He says, you obviously have this down to a fine art, but how likely is it that the capsule will land where you need it to? Is there any contingency for if it goes off course? No, uh, it won't go off course. It won't, it, uh, you know, the tragic correction maneuver has been done very precisely. So there's no threat that it will go outside the landing ellipse that's been set uh, already. So what of nominal cases, what possible of nominal cases will be, will be like, uh, what if parachute doesn't get deployed? Well, in that case, it's gonna, it's gonna come down to earth like a ballistic, you know, but in a ballistic way, but even in that situation, we do have a way of uh, tracking, or we do have a way of request, re reconstructing the trajectory of the capsule so that we can get to the landing spot and try to recover it. Well, without the parachute, there might be a much bigger damage to the capsule itself, but we still try to, to get the capsule, uh, recover the capsule. Uh, there could be a situation where, where that beacon signal may not be, because something wrong with the the with with the transmitter, but even in that case, if a parachute is deployed, we can we can we have a laser radar system, radar system. So we try to we emit the radar signal and try to get the reflection signal back from the parachute, and that way we can we can track the motion of the capsule and, and then try to try to guess the landing spot and then try to recover the capsule so there are you know there are some a few non of nominal possible cases but uh, we do have countermeasures for all of them excellent thank you and i just have a small follow-up question out of curiosity uh you say that the landing spot is, or, or the um the trajectory is very precise I'm curious how how precise is this landing spot? So, will you be searching in in a few kilometers radius, or or will it be a few meters radius? Uh, how how precise is the landing? Yeah, so uh, you know, in space, 
especially when landing in somebody else's territory, we, we, we make a very conservative estimate. And the biggest, well, that, that landing ellipse is like 100 kilometer east-west and then 200 kilometers north-south, something like this. So it's kind of, it sounds very big. The reason that it, that it is big is that because of the uncertainty in terms of the wind. And, uh, but once we know, and it's, it's, on the, it's based on the assumption that we don't know what the wind will be like. So let's take the, let's take the dispersion, you know, let's take, let's, let's assume that we, we just don't know what's gonna what the wind will be on, on the day of, of landing. Then, because of the wind, the landing ellipsis becomes a, that large. But if, once you specify the day, like, you know, Sunday this, this, this weekend, and then you have the nice weather prediction, nice wind profile prediction from your authorities, then that landing ellipse becomes much smaller, like uh, ten, tens of kilometers. Then um, you can fly, you can you know send your helicopter and try to try try to track the beacon signal and then get to the landing spot. So you know when you plan, you have to do it very conservative. But once you decide the day of landing and once you have all the weather prediction information, then the landing ellipse becomes tens of kilo, ten, ten kilometer ish. That's that that will be the the answer to your question. Excellent, thank you for that. And I have another question from Jackson Ryan, science editor from CNET. He says, for Anthony, uh, what have you seen from the Australian public in terms of excitement and interest in this mission? Do you get a sense that there's real enthusiasm for it? Now, thank you for that question. I think the first thing uh, we is that we're just ramping up our media media engagement, talk about what is exciting about the higher booster two mission. But the first thing we've been mindful of is that we've been dealing in a pandemic uh, circumstance. If we turn to South Australia, where there was a recent outbreak, we've been mindful that as we look through the missions, our focus has been the success of the mission and ensuring that public safety is in place. But now that we're getting closer uh, to the, the return of the capsule, we are seeing real growing interest. I know within the agency, we've had a lot of outreach from from media and which is reflecting, I think, the interest in the community about what this means. And I think as we step back again, this is the beautiful thing about space. Space inspires. I talked about what has been a challenging 2020 year. I think what we really hope with the Higher Booster 2 mission, this gives a sense of inspiration and in closing the year out on a positive. And the other part I would talk about with, with space is that Space is this beautiful thing that can bring the world together. Uh, it has an inspirational art with great technical projects such we're seeing with Hayabusa 2, with what they're achieving is first in the world and just a testament to the capability that is there. So we get this great technological achievement. And the other part that the agency will always talk about is how this relates to everyday life in the community. We'll have the inspiration and in getting the kids engaged in space, knowing something's coming back from an asteroid into Australia and Australians can connect with that. But of course, then we can talk about the great work that uh, Andrew Seedhouse is doing with DSTG. We've got the work that CSIRO is doing. And of course, all these other space technologies that are now improving our lives. So this gives us a really strong base. We're seeing this growing interest and I can just reflect on the, the Australian Space Agency over our two year journey. The amount of engagement we have in anything to do with space is phenomenal. We have media reach of 80 million plus a year. There is just an appetite and thorst thirst because it's ins inspirational. It's going to create some really exciting collaborations in the future. And I think Australians want to be part of that journey. Thank you. And just a follow up question for this, and I guess for anyone involved in this, in this briefing, um, as you say, there's a lot of excitement, um, especially among, among young people and children. Um, what, uh, what emerging careers and, and industries are you finding from having a space agency now? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll kick off and then obviously others can uh, contribute. I think Australia's got a very, very strong place. What we did very early on is have a look across Australia and where Australia could play a role. And Masaka San and I were talking about this the other day about how does Australia engage in the space community and bring its great capabilities and pr plug its capabilities into gaps and niches into what is a, a growing space economy forecast to be one 
billion um so one uh trillion dollars by uh anyway it's going to be quite big by uh by 20 by 2040 and so across australia um there are great capabilities we're seeing if we look at our mining sector with automation and robotics. Uh, there's already, a, we already work in harsh environments. We automate the platforms at distance and they're the type of technologies that we can move uh, into space. We look at the work that Ed's doing with communications. We've got a unique location in the Southern hemisphere, which means we're gonna to continue to support advanced communications uh, in the in the future and that includes optical and quantum uh, technologies we've got companies that are looking around uh, new rocket technologies to support activities going forward we're going to have data analysis through earth observation this comes back to the other part of space is not only do we have the inspirational projects we've got skills here in australia that will draw on space technologies that improve farming that improve transportation that help us monitor drought and as we approach a bushfire season uh looking at ways that we can use with uh, natural disasters so we have this extremely strong base and now what we're focusing on how do we plug those capabilities in and that's one of the reasons we're doing uh, the moon to mars project with nasa which is a 150 million dollar program because nasa and international partners want australia at the table because we have these capabilities that can allow allow the world to go back to the moon and onto mars so extremely exciting future for us um, going forward so Libya, I wonder if I can jump in after Anthony there and follow up on that. So over the past 75 years, CSRO has built very strong capabilities in Earth observation, radio astronomy, spacecraft tracking, as we just discussed, and managing uh, the complex facilities around tracking. And, and our uh, future science platform for space technology was just launched uh, just a few years ago. And it's funding those activities to develop those technologies to lead to the innovations that Anthony was just talking about in the space sector. And this is in support of the Australian Space Agency's goal of tripling the size of the Australian space industry by 2030. So hand in glove with the agency, CIRO are working together to create those industrial opportunities. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. And I um, just have a question about the, the sample itself. So um, you spoke about asteroids like bringing, possibly bringing water to Earth, last I think. Uh, are you expecting to find water in the higher boosted two sample? And are there any substance, other substances you expect to find? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I described the concept of snow line. So what, what I, in a more general sense, um, if a planetary body is born in closer to the sun, then volatiles cannot cannot stay in that body. You know, volatiles will be will be will be in the form of uh, gas or va vapor in the case of water. So they cannot they cannot get trapped inside the body. So anything, including water, vo volatile element, volatile elements should come should have come from outer part of the solar system. Uh, water is one thing, and the other key material will be the organic materials. Organic mat uh, original Earth, if not, if organic materials were not brought from outer part of the solar system, it, organic matter would not have existed on the planet. And organic matter is another key element for the, for habitability, for the origin of life. So it's, and the, uh, the shape of planetary science is really getting to the question of why we are here, you know, how, how the origin of life related question. So Hayabusa 2 is, is kind of uh, one of the precursors, you know, leading the transformation of the planetary science. So that's what I expect of um, Ryugo samples. Well, well, hydrated minerals is one thing, and then organic materials is the other. Is the other thing. Those are the two top two top key um, science questions we should address via real samples. Thank you. And, and how big is the sample that you're expecting? Okay. Uh, so uh, one gram ish is the is would be the official answer. And uh, judging from the the movie clip we obtained during the sampling. I believe we got that much. So, uh, and one gram may sound small for, for some of you, but 
for an expert, one gram is huge. You know, one gram is enough to address the science question we have in our mind. That's amazing. I just figure out um, and so uh, I've got another question from Lauren Hughes. She's a science journalist from Cosmos magazine. She'd like to know how will the sample return capsule be protected from biological contamination during the process of returning it to Japan? And why would this be so important? Okay, so um, it's not necessarily biological contamination, but it's, it's contamination in general. So uh, maybe I should describe from the plant Planetary protection issue. Um, bringing back sample, bringing back extra extraterrestrial samples. You know, in some extreme cases, it can be very dangerous. You know, bringing something wrong from from outside our planet. So, in the case of uh, Ryugu, we did go through an international review. We said we will our mission is something like this. Our, our target asteroid is something like this, and the way we bring back the sample is like this. So it should it shouldn't. Uh, it's not, it wouldn't have a destructive effect to the terrestrial environment. We have to go through that review and we did pass that review and uh, so our, our operation is safe. But then, then, but, but the real question is, uh, real good samples has an, has an you know, organic material relevant question. And in space, organic materials is really really precious you know it's it's a comp complicated molecule and in in space environment it's not easy to produce them but on earth because of because of you know um because of of bi bio process organic materials everywhere and uh it's, it can be easily produced by us or by any, you know, bio, through bio, bio, biological process. So conta, con, con, contamination of Ryugo sample, you, you know, precious material in, in Ryugo sample may be a trivial thing on Earth. So if we are not careful enough, we may just spoil the, the value of the samples. So that's why we care so much about not con, about the contamination issue. Um, so there are two, two, two issues, you know, don't contaminate Earth by bringing something wrong, which, which will not happen for the case of Hayabusa 2, because we have passed the review and uh, the mission is not, doesn't have that kind of characteristics. But when it comes to keeping the value of the samples, science value of the samples, we have to keep on being careful. And we ask the scientists who will analyze the sample to be careful as well. Excellent, thank you for that. And I have another question here from Jackson Ryan at CNET for Anthony. Uh, he says, wonder if you can talk to some of the differences in working with different agencies across the world. What are some of the notable differences between JAXA and NASA, for example? Uh, uh, thanks for the thanks for the question. I think one one thing I would the great thing about working with any of the space agencies, we're all we all come with the same passion. And we all kind of come with wanting to achieve some significant science and outcomes and improving the lives of people. And I think that's the one thing that we see time and time again. And we speak the same language, which is often, let's, what are we going to do in space and how are we going to inspire the nation? So I think from that perspective, that's been truly, truly, truly exciting. And the one thing we're very uh, grateful for, we're a new space agency. Uh, we've come at a time when the there's been a rapid transformation of uh, the space economy. We've got businesses involved, new opportunities opening up. But what we've seen with nations around the world and, and our counterparts is they've opened up and engaged with us with open arms, shared their lessons and, uh, and seen the value that Australia can play, whether it's supporting great missions such as Hayabusa 2, putting our capabilities into some exciting missions going forward. So I think it's... Um, uh, it's just been great to be welcomed with open arms and we're speaking uh, the same language to really inspire not only people here in Australia, but the world. That's fantastic, thank you. And we're slowly getting to the end of our Q&A, so if you do have any questions, please make sure to get them in as soon as you can. Um, but I just have another question. We've uh, We've seen Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2. Are there any plans for a Hayabusa 3 mission and what would that involve? 
Yes, very good question. So uh, we have, we're preparing the next sample return mission, sample return from a small body, and the target small body is Phobos. It's one of the moons of Mars. So it's going to be a Martian moon sample return mission. And what's really interesting about this mission is that, you know, Phobos itself is an interesting body, but on the surface of Phobos, there could be a debris from Mars itself. You know, in, in ancient Mars, there could have been a big impact on, onto its surface, and the debris coming from the motion surface could have, might, might be, uh, well, there's a good chance that uh, debris from the Martian surface is, uh, is sed sedimented or accumulated on the, on the surface of Phobos. So the major purpose is to get the sample of, of, Phob of Phobos, of course, but we may be getting uh, Martian samples as well. So it, uh, the mission has a name MMX, um, Martian Moons Exploration Mission, but it's like a poor month's Porsche to get the Martian samples. It's not like NASA's big Mars, Mars sample return mission, but uh, as Anthony said, this is how we how we survive in this uh, in this in this situation. You know, we we're not a big agency, but still we want to do something exciting. So getting to Phobos and getting sample back from Phobos, but at the same time, maybe we get Martian sample. We we may be running the first. Martian Mars Mars sample return mission. So it's this kind of excitement we are we are uh, you know we are, we are following. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And um and I guess my, my last question would be with with this uh this Phobos mission, will Australia be involved in that one too? Yes, uh maybe. Maybe I, I haven't talked to, uh, I, we didn't have any official discussion yet, but, you know, especially my, my experience this time, I'm really inclined towards, uh, towards having Umela as the landing site for the MMX sample return capsule. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, we'll have to talk to you again um, when you come back. Oh, ah, well, I think I'm just double checking. Yes, I believe that's all of the questions. So. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's it for today's event. So a reminder that this briefing is an immediate release and meaning it is not under embargo. A full recording of today's pre presentations will be posted on CIMEX shortly. For any further inquiries, contact the Australian Space Agency on, uh, and I'll, I'll use international codes here, plus 618 8406 Four seven nine eight, or you can email media at space.gov.au. Journalists looking for other experts can also contact Dr. Eleanor Samson. She is from the Desert Fireball Network team at Curtin University. Ellie was also involved in this project and has kindly provided an expert quote, which you can find on Finex, and um, and you're free to use that in your stories. And you can also get in touch with her on plus six one. 428-662-910. Apparently she might have a little bit of um, touching reception, so if you're having trouble getting in contact with her, just shoot her a text. Um, you can also get her via the Curtin Media team on plus 61-401-103683. Feel free to contact us direct at the Science Media Center if you do have any specific requests or questions on plus 618 7120-8666, or you can email info at smc.org.au. Thank you again to today's speakers, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. You've been wonderful. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for this online briefing. Thanks, everyone. We wish us a successful recovery operation. Thank you very much. Best of luck.